Okay, time to start. Seven, 7 p.m. All right, everybody. Okay, good. That's pretty good. Uh, it's our habit, as usual, to rise and say Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, just a few words about the Historical Society before we begin our program. Um, let's see, the next, the next session we'll be having will be next month, uh, the third Thursday, May 18th, and that will be Joe Madura, um, who will be talking on William Gratwick, North Tonawanda's most famous non-citizen. So uh, everybody know what Gratwick is? Okay, park. <laughs> Anybody else have any idea about Gratwick? Yeah, I went to the elementary school. <laughs> there you go. And our, our school thing was letter rain, letter four, work from Gratwick, number four. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. pretty good. <laughs> Gratwick's also part of, part of North Tonawanda where there was a whole bunch of uh, German citizens that lived there. Some of my relatives lived there. Some of them came from Burkholz. Uh, Gratwick, the portion of Gratwick is sort of like from where the NT Fire Company is there on Ward Road and Frederica and Jackson and uh, all those streets there between Oliver and uh, down. So, uh, but anyhow, that's what he's going to talk about next month. Um, let's see. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, I don't know if, you, if you're if you a member, you probably received their brief this month, this one. And uh, if you're not a member, you should become a member. Um, you can see me for that. Uh, there's a membership form on the back of this too. But uh, one of the new services we are offering our, our members is the ability to have all our dear briefs from 1972 on online for you to search, which has been a great uh, boon for people that want to do family research or things like that. So we now have that available to members at no cost. So you can search that, if you know what I mean. There. It's, it's, uh, all those dare briefs are stored and they have the ability to say, put in your last name, and hit the button and it'll come by and, and uh, bring out all the dear briefs that maybe have your last name in it or your first and last, what have you. So it's a great service. If anybody is a member and hasn't taken advantage of it, I urge you to just write an email to uh, Ruth Cannon. Uh, and if you need that, but you can see Ruth. Ruth, could you raise your hand? Yeah, right over there. Or see me or any of the board members. And we'll introduce you to Ruth and write an email to her and she can set you up. So uh, easy to do. Um, and that's a great service as well. Um, there is another, uh, uh, the American, the German American experience during World War I is uh, going to be presented by the North uh, York chapter of Palatines to America, which is the German Genealogy Society, um, and that'll be coming up on, what did I just say, May 6th? Mm -hmm. May 6th. So I have information here on that if you would want to attend it. Where is that? It starts at St. Louis Church on Main Street in Buffalo, okay. and um, we have a full day, and we end up at Concordia Cemetery. Okay. Sounds like a nice afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, so, without further ado, I'll introduce Hugh Neeson, who is our present presenter for tonight. What a great uh, gentleman. He's been here before with a very interesting topic about Bell, Larry Bell, and all the doings in the Bell Aerospace. 
Go ahead. Well, thank you very much for having me. I want to tell you, I made a calculation of how many times I've gone past this intersection growing to develop over yeah. my 45 years. 10,000 times. <laughs> Never had a flight time. <laughs> I uh, originally wrote a book in 2013, which was to cover a period of time that I was at Bell and after Larry Bell died in 1956. So that covered a period until the end of Bell. That was in 2013. A whole bunch of guys from Bell said, God, I wish I knew you were doing this book. I will wrote something for this. I said, we'll do it. We're going to have appendices. So I have about 20 appendices in my book written by mostly Bell people. And recently, I became aware through a professor at uh, Buffalo State now University. His name is Ilya Greenberg, born in the Ukraine, uh, educated in Moscow, came to America 25 years ago. He's a full professor. All his life, he has been a student of Soviet aviation. And has written a book with on harvesting from uh, the Smithsonian Institution on the Red Phoenix Rising, the story of the rising of the uh, Russian Air Force, Air Force during World War II. Well, he's a pretty aggressive guy. He showed up at the museum when we were in the Carborundum Museum downtown at the Ceramics Museum. And he said, Mr. Lee, so I understand you from Bell, yeah. He said, uh, Jim Pierce of Warbird Finders Limited, England, has just recovered a P-39 in a league in Russia. You've got to buy it. <laughs> what does he want for? Half a million. We didn't have half a million of that. Well, it turns out, as you know, the Indians were given that whole plaza down there, including the Carolina building, which Frank Amendola from Lady Paul's over there. And they immediately wanted to kick us out, the Indians. So we went to federal court. Judge Scrutiny, who was actually a time and graduated as I am, said, why don't you guys try the, the uh, court in the Indian court? So we went down to Cataraugus, and sure enough, we get in the courtroom. Lady judge, now by the way, women run all the significant offices in Indian society. And the judge comes in, pounds his table, you know, the desk, and she said, why don't you people leave us alone? You've been prosecuting us for 500 years. She was being recorded. And my lawyer went over to me and he said, we just won this case. Well, we appealed to the appeals court and as soon as they saw what she said, all right, they settled. 1.4 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I get a call from the British Imperial War Museum in Waterloo. They say, Mr. Neeson, we'd like to borrow the rocket belt and put it and a James Bond 499's only series in London for a year. We would like you to fly over first class. How long do you think it took me to say yes? <laughs> a man or something. And I had a cousin in London, and he had a BMW, and we drove down to Jim Pierce's place, and there's the P-39. He said, Mr. Neeson, this airplane belongs to the place from which she came. Instead of 450,000, I'll sell it to you for 450,000. We bought it. It's in our museum. It's one of only three that are left 
I'll wait till you get this number. 5,000 P-39s that were sent to Russia early in the war. They devastated the Luftwaffe. And some 2,000 kills for victories. I would rather say victories. It's now known as B-39 Air Cobra, built out here probably by people in your family and others over the years, that now is recorded as having more victories than any other American airplane. The story of the Russians thing has never been told. So Ilya Grinberg owns one of the first new chapters in my most recent book, which is named Larry Bell's Legacy. And that's for his legacies include uh, uh, aerospace pioneering, which Larry Bell did. Because on the table, you'll see a few examples of the most famous things. <coughs> <laughs> the X-1, which broke the sound barrier. <laughs> that one. And that's probably the most famous thing he did, outside of the Bell rocket, though, which is the most insignificant thing Bell ever did, but the most famous, by the way. Anyway, the cover of the book is a monument in Fairbanks, Alaska, where these some 5,000 P-39s were flown from Niagara Falls Airport to Great Falls, Montana, by WASP, women's air service pilots, who were not paid. And only recognized by the government recently to give them some compensation. So they flew them out there. Bush pilots flew them up to Fairbanks. And this statue, which is on the cover, stands in the middle of Fairbanks. And one side is an American airman. The other side is a Russian airman, and that's for all these 5,000, actually 7,500 because they got 2,500 air covers, and they also got 2,500 uh, king covers. The story needs to be told, and so it is told by Ilya Ginberg, who is an authority on this. So it's not me speaking, but it is. Larry Bell's biggest contribution in Western New York contribution was those 5,000 airplanes that helped Russia turn back this, this, the Soviet, uh, turn back Germany in World War II. So that's the essence of the book, and then we updated it for other things that we've done. There's a copy of the books here. We're selling them for, what do we say? Mary? We're selling the hardcovers for what? 30 and soft. How much? 30. 30. And the, Soft color. And uh, out of the book, let me tell you the Larry Bell's airplane made an enormous contribution. I'll show photographs in the middle of the two. I'm sorry. In the late 50s, things weren't too good at Bell. Uh, and out of the woodwork comes Lockheed, me, who was working for the CIA, because the president of the uh, president of the United States, General Eisenhower, decided he didn't like people like Gary Powers flying over the Soviet Union. What happened to Gary Powers? He got shot down. So he was told that you could probably do orbital reconnaissance with as much accuracy from orbit from a spacecraft. And in the hole, Lockheed shows up at Bell. They have a workhorse on her stage called the Agena. <laughs> Long story short, in 1958, we started to get a contract for those. It saved Bell. We built 420 engines for the program. And that took 98 million photographs of the Soviet Union. And my editor of my book and magazine, 
wrapped up this subset of the magazine, which says, on Kodiak Mullet. Do you remember that with the, the starting line, the Kodiak Mullet? Below it, it says, in space. And that program kept the Cold War cold. We knew more about the Soviet Union than they did. <laughs> Copies of this is over there, too. So that, uh, uh, Nancy. Oh, yeah. Here's Nancy's <laughs> uh, presentation she has made for me about the book. And I won't go through all this. I will talk for about 30 minutes or so. And uh, you can wave me off whenever you want. But uh, let's go. Now, here, you know, see these lights we have on here? We're so used to going on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I should. Oh, yes. Okay. We uh, think that we, uh, we don't appreciate that we live in modern times. For example, the light bulb. We go to a place switch and get away. 1999, there was no such thing. So, who was the first man to make a machine using power? It was water power. The guy's name is Luke Cohen. Newcomen first invented a steam powered pump to pump water out of the whale's coal barn. It's the first use of expanding steam, contracting steam, throw a big lever, and, and, and pump water out. I say his name should be changed to Do Things Are Coming. <laughs> Okay, now that is the oldest engineering organization in the world, the Newcomen Society. Hmm. In the first century, or the 1800s, who comes along with Watt? What does Watt do? Does anybody know? Steam. Makes the steam engine. Steam engine. What are the first power? Boats. All the sailing ships were off the seas in 10 years. They could go about four or five knots. The new sailing ships could go. 20, 25 knots, steam power. What came next? Railroads, 1835. Made the end of the Guadalcanal. Well, because <laughs> there was a steam power driving trains, numerous times, it's the most efficient way to transport goods is the train. Of course, trucks take over a lot of it simply because of easy delivery. So then, more things come along. Stephen Owens in England developed telegraphy. And we needed something to take care of, to control the railroads, so there's a telegraph system set up, and the whole world began to use telegraph. You know, mail by telegraph. Then, uh, next comes along is uh, many electronic motors, DC motors, uh, all over the country, and uh, many electronic motors, as they say. And then who comes along and invents the telephone? Alexander Graham Bell. <coughs> then Edison comes along, and then Edison Lee Bell. Marconi comes along with wireless transmission over the ocean and the lands. We got the beginnings of radio and television. What did I think? Over here because of my eyes. And say, in this company, in this country, we all know about this. What's the big monument in Gold Island? Tesla. Tesla, over the dead body of Edison, who only wanted DC power, he said AC would be much better use. More efficient, lose less energy, and the whole world now runs on AC. Many of you people here might remember in the first days of AC, it was 25 cycles. The lights flickered. <coughs> then we went to 60 cycles. And then along comes 
the fabulous Play Brothers. They opened 1903 at Kitty Hawk. Now, why Kitty Hawk? Kitty Hawk, they, you know, they, they, these guys not getting into everything. They found out there was 40 mile an hour winds at Kitty Hawk. So they took their right flyer down there and put enough power in it uh, to make it go 50 miles an hour because it was already going 40 miles an hour standing still. <laughs> at the end of the day, they flew 400 some feet. First flight of man buildings. <clears throat> they knew they had a lot to do. Uh, and they proceeded and they went back up to Ohio, Humphreys Field, which is now right past the Air Force Base. And they perfected a machine that could turn, climb, and control the oak. Now they they noticed, pardon my hands, but you know, when a bird's turn, birds don't turn like this. Birds turn like this. Or they get turned. They see my hands? Yeah. Well, they built a machine. It's a white flyer B, which began to fly 20 miles out in the lumber and was flying perfectly and demonstrated six degree of freedom freight. Why do I say six degrees? Press a roll up and down. That was important. And then along comes a Western New Yorker. Who's ever heard of Glenn Hammond Curtis? <coughs> My Amos work. Well, he jumps into the game, and what kind of machine shop does he have down there? He has a motorcycle shop. He drove a motorcycle 136 miles an hour on the, the Miami Beach, 19. 96. He was called the bastard's man alive. <laughs> he knew that they had to do something different. The Wright Brothers airplane was wide open. How would you like to be driving, riding along in their airplane in a seat, no not even a seat belt, and get hit by some birds? Or how about when the rains come on? Okay? Began to be realized by the industry that we needed a hollow. A ship has a hollow, right? Trains have a place to put cargo. So somebody said, well, what for an airplane, it should look like the, a handle on a, on a <coughs> stove, a, a cooking pot. And there's a French word for that. French word, I don't know what it is called that. But in English, it's fuselage. An airplane should have a fuselage. Guess what? By 1914, Curtis fills the sky. You probably get this you know, astounding number. He built 8,000 jennies in World War I. You know that number? <laughs> he also was on a lake, wasn't he? He developed flying boats. All motor boats these days have a step in them. You know what I mean by all stuff in it? Mm -hmm. That allows you to get up and plane on the water faster. His <coughs> sequence had a, a uh, stuff, hydraulic stuff, so he could get the airplane up on the water planing. And Winston Churchill heard about it and ordered 750 of them. <laughs> so Curtis had to build a lot of airplanes. So he, I say, this is what they say in the movies. He shuffled off the buffalo. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, why buffalo? Well, buffalo, at the turn of the century, uh, 1900s, was a bustling town, one of the richest places in the United States, simply because of its location on the lakes before the Welland Canal came with a hole in that. But anyway, Buffalo was strong, and he remembered that the Pan American Exposition was lit by Tesla's AC power. <laughs> so already Buffalo had a big manufacturing base in wood, Taiwan especially, and it had now electric motors and so forth. So he comes to Buffalo and he built a place on Kenmore Avenue, 
you know, you know, it's cursed it. And the government built him a plane on Elmwood Avenue where you were consolidated aircraft came in. And he built uh, 750 flying boats for Churchill. And that flying boat is the H-1, first airplane to kill a German submarine. Churchill always, by the way, I'll mention right now, Premier Stalin's summary of World War II is as follows. That war was won with Russian blood. Now they lost 10 million soldiers. Hundreds of millions of people fought it at Stalin's hand, but they lost a lot of blood. He said, British brains. Anybody got any idea why he said British brains? Anybody ever heard of the Enigma Code? Enigma Code was the super secret Russian or German coding machine. Great Britain sank a submarine in shallow water off of Britain and sent divers down and recovered it in an Enigma machine. And they put some bright people in Benchley Palace to work on it. And they were working and working and working, and they couldn't get to a solution. And they were all, after work in a pub near Bensley Palace, and the lady who was working with this group said, I got it. I got it. Let's go back. They went back to Bensley Palace. They said, well, what do you mean you've got it? I'll bet you, she said, that every message that comes out of Germany says, Heil Hitler to say. Do you think that's true? It was. Seven hours later, the machine closed on the solution to the, to the code. Of the, right away, he told Churchill that a certain U boat was going out to sea, go kill it. He said, No, I'm not going to do that. I don't like to give the Germans a hunch that we broke it. We'll see. All right? Churchill, even though he was outside of the government, also was told by his scientific advisor that radio waves could be used to bounce off of airplanes. We call that what? Radar. Even though he wasn't prime minister during the 30s, he had enough influence that Britain had a fully